Okay. All right, it's going to share screen. Okay. All right. Does it all look good on your end? Okay. Um, yes, I think introductions have been done. I'm currently a UC Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow. I'm working with Dr. Sim Schneider at UC Santa Cruz, and he's been helping me, you know, piece together the story a little bit more and um, figuring out just really what is going on with this material assemblage and how to analyze this with bigger picture issues of what a community formation looks like during the colonial period. And, you know, Mission La Purisima Concepcion is located in Lompoc, California. When I got a job at California State Parks during my undergraduate or right after my undergraduate, one of the first things I did, sorry, I've got to, hopefully you can't hear the father that tried to barge into the room. Um, one of the first things I did was a survey at Mission La Purisima. And we took the regular tour that the normal visitors take. When you go on the tour, the first thing you come across is the salmon colored church. And then you head down the colonnade through the area where the industrial shops are located. In the back, you'll find interpretive centers like this olive press. And there are other places like this blacksmith shop that really highlight this kind of very kind of Eurocentric mission. On the other side of the mission is the Chumash village that lived there. And you can see this is a, a very barren space in the mission landscape. But we know that there were over a thousand individuals that lived here at this time. So once we, I saw this and started stud studying this community more in depth, I really wanted to highlight this indigenous side of the story in this community at the mission, which is known as Amuwun in Somala. And this is not, you know, unique to Mission La Purisima Concepcion. Missions across the state of California and North America really emphasize this mission myth that missions are romantic places that are idealized to this this old Spanish days, but they've really been mobilized to erase indigenous presence with the strong focus on these Eurocentric buildings and gardens. And, you know, this was really in the minds of early archaeologists who were investigating the indigenous side of the story in these missions, like James Beats. In the 1960s, he was one of the first to really call attention to the indigenous village in missions. And he fit it within this acculturation framework, essentially saying exactly in his book that the decline of the Chumash under the missions was rapid, spectacular, and complete. And just when you see the mission landscape as it is, and you go walking there like I did with some Chumash elders before the project started, we came across an olivella piece. It wasn't even like a shell bead. It was just an olivella shell. And that symbolized indigenous presence. Olivella shell were incredibly important to the Chumash community. And just coming across that shell was clear evidence that they were present in that mission. So a part of what I was doing was to look at this through the theoretical framework of praxis, which according to Randall McGuire, really takes a three-step approach with gaining knowledge in the world, critiquing the world, and taking action in the world. Well, just by doing the mission tour, there is a real strong critique of how this mission is represented. I wanted to gain knowledge in the world through archaeology and collaboration, and then take action in the world by actually highlighting indigenous presence in the mission landscape. And that's the framework through how the project really got going. 
here are just a few people that I worked with over the course of my project. Um, I really wanted to emphasize an archaeology that was by, with, and for Indigenous peoples. Um, just by doing the general site assessment, having members come out and work some GPR, having a paid tribal monitor, and including Chumash youth at certain points of the project. And the archaeological assemblage is incredibly diverse. We have a lot of glass beads that were used that were incorporated into the shell bead money system. Um, this ladrillo with the footprint of a hooved animal was on the floor of the indigenous adobe barracks where the Chumash lived. We also found this beautiful whole um, abalone shell that was looked as if it had been intentionally placed there, you know, uh, and uncovering it was really special when our monitor was there and then conducted a prayer over it. And then we have olivella shell beads that have needle drills in them. So they're incorporating needle, metal needles to actually drill these beads. And the people that would left behind these belongings were dynamic. There was 497 women that were recorded in the mission records in 1813 when this mission started. And there were 507 men and children are in this cate these categories as well. And I should mention that this is a really late mission, 1813, everywhere else in the Santa Barbara, the Chumash homeland with the five other missions were established in 1776, the earliest one at Mission San Buenaventura but there was an earthquake in 1812. So they moved this mission to its current place that was then reconstructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. But it's still authentic in that there, there are unique archeological assemblages that are still there. And I wanna provide a little bit of a historical framework before I dive too much into the nuances of the project. Um, the first mission, 1782, was at Mission San Buenaventura. So this is the Spanish Franciscan missionary system. In 1810, there was the Mexican War of Independence that began. Essentially, um, at this time in 1810, the Mexican, um, the Mexican government wanted to be recognized as an independent entity outside of Spanish rule. In 1821, the Treaty of Cordoba guarantees independence. And this is when significant change happens throughout the missions. And then by 1832, the mission system comes to an end. So there's a lot going on with this Spanish and Mexican period. And it is a very interesting moment in time that I want to dive into because Mission La Prisima Concepcion represents the waning Spanish frontier and the beginning of this new Mexican regime in 1813. And, that, and I wanna contrast these two a little bit, kind of set the stage for how I'm seeing the archeological materials. In the Spanish mission system, there was forcible relocation programs through processes of reducción that actually brought local groups into one centralized town. This was a very fast event that took, you know, maybe a decade or more, but most of the communities in as much as 20 years have joined mission establishments. There was this creation of this new multi-scalar community and this kind of pan-regional identity that happens when all these members form a new community in the mission. Economic policies outlawed trade with merchants other than those authorized by the crown. So there was no merchant to merchant trade. And there was this hierarchy of indigenous officials in the mission who were permitted status and responsibility such as governors or alcaldes. And the Mexican system is a lot different. There was this opening up of global trade networks. There was no longer just singular sources of materials coming in from San Blas. Now there was more private merchant to merchant trade. 
Fishing communities began to produce more output and they became increasingly self-reliant because they weren't getting their finances from Spain anymore. Native Californians gained more opportunities for freedom. Um, this is outlined in the Plan de Iguala and um, that came from that Treaty of Cordoba. And there were more rebellions during this time, which is really interesting. So after 1821, there's more rebellions reported throughout the missions. And this is especially true with the Chumash revolt that happens in 1824, just three years after the Mexican system starts. And here is where this community is situated. This is Amuwu or Amuwun. It is the large Chumash village that is opposite of the, the main side of the building. So if you could see over here, this is actually where the church and the industrial areas and the Padres quarters were. And this is the area that represents the um, where the Chumash lived, including uh, their traditional tule thatched houses where their families would live, as well as the adobe barracks that were built. And before I started this project, I did some geophysical surveys and got some previous map overlays from excavations that had occurred there from the 1930s and the 50s and the 60s, just to identify, you know, what hasn't been done and to figure out you know, exactly where I could place a unit in order to get into a house floor. So over here, you'll see the actual village itself with the area that shows where, what it would have looked like if the adobe barracks were reconstructed. The area down here represents these nails that were placed in the ground from Glenn Ferris back in the 90s that um, you know pointed out the southern extent of the corners of the building and then he also did that to the north so that's how we were able to actually determine where these rooms were based off of Glenn Ferris's work at the mission. And I wanted to get a little closer look because I came across this map from the CCC and I identified exactly which rooms were excavated by them and which ones hadn't been. And you can see here, there are these areas that are left blank within the rooms. And that was what I targeted. I put in three units with the help of um, undergraduate students at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, we started with this large, just one by one unit. And while the placement of the unit is spatially accurate, we were a little bit off with the definition of the building. So we never came across this wall here, although we probably would have if we would, would have expanded it Southwest a little bit more, but um, I expanded it to the, Northeast because we came across a footing and right here to the Northwest, we did come across the front portion where the door would have been to the front of this building. So we really were excavating within this room. And what we found followed in line with what previous researchers like Beats had uncovered here. There was a very large roof tile collapse that was about a foot down from the main ground surface. And what it looks like stratigraphically was the surface with um, surface to tile. And I followed Beats's stratigraphic kind of understanding of the soils when I put this together, where he calls this surface to tile before getting down from the tile to the floor. And that's exactly what we found. We found that this was a bunch of fill that represents materials after 1848 and everything under the roof tile collapse represents materials really before 1848 and to 1812 when this building was established. We found a lot of charcoal on the floor, 
and um, shell artifacts as well as little pieces of shell. And I'm just gonna highlight some of the most interesting things that were on the floor. There was this brine being stone and pestle, which is super interesting because just really represents this past meeting the present with the pestle that was so you know, essential for pounding acorn and the grinding stone is a classic historic period artifact that was used to grind and sharpen artifacts. It would have been placed on a trough and then spun with a crank. And that is how carpenters and other industry workers would have sharpened their tools. So to find it, now, in C2 in this way actually became like the symbol of the project uncovering the indigenous past for Mission La Purisima. And here's this beautiful shell that we found that looked as if it had been intentionally placed right on the floor in the adobe barracks. And when our monitor, Gina Mascara Lucas, unearthed it for the first time in a century, all the students who were in the field school and the visitors who were at the park really came to watch this prayer that was conducted over the shell where this, there was this meeting of the past and present. And seeing this abalone shell outside of a strict archeological context and through a community member's worldview. And the rest of my talk is really gonna focus on these midden units because these midden units have helped us to identify the area of the Thule thatched houses. And we placed five midden units in this large area across the adobe, the, the native rancheria. And we found a lot in the midden units. There's just a lot of shellfish, a lot of burned animal bone, and other little pieces of ceramic and olivella shell and things like this. And when we look at these little categories, we can get a really good sense of just what everyday life would have been like. For example, when we look at the shellfish, one of the main things that were there were Mytilus californianus, and this is mussel shell. It made over 97% of everything that we identified. So mussel shell was incredibly important and the uh, mission is like right around here. It would have taken about 17, it's about 17 miles away from the coast. And using data gathered from UC Santa Cruz, they were able to trace these um, areas where these shell occurrences are occurring. And one of them is this hotbed of California mussel that is located like directly in line with where Mission La Purisima is. And I suspect that this is an ancestral gathering location that would have been used in the 1800s by the Chumash community. There was also a variety of terrestrial mammal, reptile and bird. We found deer, jackrabbit, bobcat, brush rabbit, gray fox, turtle and crow, just some of the local wild animals as well as cow and sheep, which really made uh, the largest percentage of the funnel. And here's that beautiful ungulate footprint in a Ladria. We don't really know what animal this could have been, likely a cow, um, a small calf. And you know, when you look at this, it really kind of represents the, you know, the sights and the sounds in this industrial area that you, you could imagine in the 1800s of what this mission would have been like. And we also identified a lot of shell beads. You know, shell beads were used for thousands of years among the Chumash. They used a variety of different parts of the shell over different periods of time. There's the spire part that sometimes would be lopped off to make spire lop beads. There's the wall portion of the bead, and you can see that it's been typed into many different categories. And there's the fascial, which is the bottom part of the bead. Well, during the historic period, they're really making a lot of wall beads. And that's really the type of main bead that we found. They're just getting it off of the wall. And you can see right here, there's H that stands for historic period beads. So they're getting it from this part of the shell. And these, this just represents some of the beads that we identified that have needle drilled holes 
And there were a lot of deeds that represent this distinct period in time from 1800 to you know, 1816. There were H2 rough fists that represent a period of time from 1816 to 1832. And there were also these H3 chip discs that are made after the missions were secularized. So this really represents a period of time from 1832 to about 1900. Now, interesting, when I was at the Society for California Archaeology meeting, I was sitting across from Mark Hilkema at the silent auction, and we were talking about beads. And his theory is that these aren't actually temporal markers. These are period, these are production stages. So H1 is like a very kind of fine grained bead that has been roughed out. H2 is the kind of medium process before getting all of the edges buffed. And H3 is just what happens when you chip it before you rough it out. And this is really interesting and I like his interpretation a lot, but that is not to say that H2 and H3 weren't also traded outside just in the stages that they were, because we know in the Huyama area that we found Chumash made H2 and H3 beads. So we also know that H2 and H3 are being treated, um, traded out, whether they are state points of a, a production stage or not. And my favorite part of the project was working with Brian and coming across all of this shell bead detritus. And shell bead detritus really shows us how many shell beads are made. And they are making a lot of shell beads here, way more than what was found with the whole shell beads that we identified. So we know that based off of the shell bead detritus, they are trading outside of the mission and keeping the networks with their communities um, beyond Mission La Parisima. And we used some experimental archaeology that Brian did, which was able to show us exactly the amount of grams that are left behind in the detritus after you make the bead. So we were able to take all of the grams of shell bead detritus we found, kind of divide it by how many grams of detritus are made from a single bead and then get a really good number about, I think it was like 500 or something beads that are being made that aren't represented in the assemblage. And there's a lot of glass beads that are, and I want to talk about these briefly. Um, these are wire wound beads. Wire wound beads um, need to be made by a single artisan that would have individually put these together with a wire and some making the glass. There are these um, type two beads. These are actually made from a, a long molten piece of glass that would have been cut. So you could make thousands of these very easily. And then you have these ceramic beads over here that were made really after the mission period, um, after 18, 32. And what we're finding here is that there are a lot of these drawn cane beads. So 101 of the beads that were identified in the entire assemblage um, were actually made by a long molten piece of glass and then just stripped. But there were a lot of wire wound beads, and I'm going to show you why that's significant, where they were found. And there's those ceramic beads. Um, before I dive into that, but here's just generally a colors of what those beads look like. There's a lot of blue beads. This is really interesting because we see a different pattern up in Northern California where there's just a lot more red beads and red beads were, you know, not as prevalent. So there are these two interaction spheres with Northern California and the South Central Coast. All right, now that I kind of situated this and gave you all this background, I'm going to get into the heart of the talk and talk about the Chumash adobe barracks compared to the area where the traditional tule thatched houses are. And the reason we know that they are here because there is nowhere within a five mile span of indigenous presence. This was the village where a thousand plus individuals would have lived. And we know that there were only a handful of them 
that could have lived in the adobe barracks. So the other individuals and families were living in their traditional tule thatched houses in and around here. And where we placed MU5 up here gives us a really good idea of where those, where that tule thatched house village was. And after I go through that, I'm going to dive into this intrasite investigation and talk about this alcalde that lived in one of these rooms right here. But first, let's talk about what's going on across the village space. So here's just a better idea of how this village is situated. There's a southern portion and a northern portion. In the southern portion, we came across MU1, which had a significant amount of detritus in it. It was a very deep midden, and pretty much MU5 was equivalent to MU1 as far as the density of artifacts that were found in the midden. MU3 really represents this more, um, you know, it's like a bare space. There wasn't really a lot found in it. This building here was established in 1823. So there may have been some spatial distance before this building was established between the community members who lived in the southern and northern extent of the village. And I'm going to talk specifically about comparing and contrasting what's going on in MU1 and MU5. There were differences in the consumption of food in these two units. In MU5, there were a lot of local made ceramics. All of the local made ceramics had residue on their exterior. So these were ceramics that were used for cooking. There was also um, some English ware and some wares that were imported from Mexico. We have a really different pattern going on in MU1. You can see it's relatively equal as far as the distribution of table wares and cooking wares. There's some imported from China, England, Mexico, and local. And there is a statistical difference between these two areas of the village in terms of the types of ceramics that are found there. And this is just kind of what the southern extent of the midden looks like. You could see here's those cooking wares, here's Chinese porcelain. Here are Mexican imports that are lead glazed and galera. And here are some um, English vessels, peasant style and um, creamware. And up in the Northern extent, it's just completely different. We have all of these cooking vessels. So what's going on? These cooking vessels really represent a community that's eating in these ceramic way and in a community form. They're not on tableware. Um, but when we look at the southern extent of the midden unit, they are cooking their ware in soapstone comals, ollas, and bowls, and serving them on these distinct tablewares to present their food. So um, although we didn't find a lot of soapstone, when I was looking at the archaeological assemblages at the mission from the Dietz collection, there is a lot of soapstone there. I published this in an article called Crafting Identity. And um, the soapstone really represents this more kind of elite way of cooking food in the mission. So we know that this is similar to other patterns that we've seen, like at El Presidio de los Ades, where they used high status tableware to replicate elite behavior, and lower caste residents use earthenware vessels almost entirely. And we're kind of seeing that here as well. There are also differences with the shell bead money economy. All of that detritus that we found was in the southern extent of the midden. There was the highest shell bead detritus identification within actually any mission to date was found at Mission La Purisima, and it was all um, within the area of the adobe barracks. The so bead production detritus was five times greater in the southern portion of the rancheria than it was in the northern portion of the rancheria. And the elite Chumash who lived in the adobe apartments may have been the primary bead producers, as was traditional 
within the, you know, the Channel Islands where it's been well documented with shell bead production as linked to an elite status. And this may have happened here as well. What's really interesting is that many islanders from Santa Cruz Island and Santa Rosa Island came to Mission La Purissima in 1816. So we know that in 1816, there was a spike of island populations that came to Mission La Purissima and they may have also been the primary bead producers. And there were also status symbols. The glass beads in the Southern extent of the unit are, have these wire wound beads. We did not find any wire wound beads in the Northern extent of the unit. And there are also these draw cane beads, but they were the more expensive type where they had these facets on them. And they were also um, red beads that were made by dissolving gold and hydraulic acids and then adding it to the molten glass. So this process increased the cost due to the value of gold. All of these fancy beads were only found in the southern part of the adobe barracks. And this is just a sample of what was found in the northern part of the knitted unit. And you can see there are no um, wire wound beads. There were also these metal adornments that we only found in the southern part of the adobe barracks. This is really important kind of thinking about work that was done with looking at how people adorn themselves with these particular items as a way to translate their status in this mission space. So these metal adornments would have been worn on clothing and were a way to signal some difference, um, at least with people who, that, who lived in their traditional tulip thatch houses, which appears that they might have not been wearing the same things. So the elite Chumash who lived in the adobe apartments wore distinct clothing and they had access to um, different types of metal ornaments and clothing. Okay, this is where I'm gonna start talking about an intrasite investigation of the Chumash adobe barracks. I'm looking specifically at this area here that was excavated by Beats in 1963. B represents the infirmary, A represents the 10 you know, apartment units that have two rooms, and then C represents another apartment units that were built in the um, 1820s, 1823. But this particularly is an area that Deet studied where part of what he came across was the infirmary in building B, but also these rooms in building A. So you could see here, the, this is in the infirmary is room seven, and these are the six other rooms that he excavated. Um, half of rooms one and two, which he claimed were indigenous people that lived there. Um, rooms three and four, he claimed were European people that lived there. And rooms five and six, he suggested were a part of a storage room that the soldier um, who lived in rooms three and four, the European soldier had access to and then would distribute to the community. Now, after analyzing this entire collection, I've kind of revamped this interpretation and I'm suggesting that rooms three and four are actually the presence of an, a higher status individual, such as a governor, um, who would have um, been there to look out for the community, but also have a stake in what's happening with the missions. This is Dietz's excavation here, and you could see that this is the infirmary. This is that storeroom, which does make a lot of sense. There was this pipe that went down the middle of it. And this is room five and six. And with that pipe, it probably made it not livable. And that's how it became a storeroom. These are rooms three and four. And these are rooms one and two. We know that there was this renovation event that led to these double floors in these rooms. 
And with this renovation event, this pipe went in and this renovation event created double floors where there was a plaster floor and then there was a floor to floor under that. And that's really significant because it provides a cap for some of the materials that we found under it. On the uppermost floor, there were distinct hot spots in room six, the proposed storerooms where that drain pipe went. There were all of these basketry impressions that had asphaltamonum. There was a lot of these soapstone kamales that were used to cook corn or wheat tortillas. And there was these metal bands and strapping that represent that there were some type of barrels that were also stored in this room. So just based off of this interpretation, it's not like anything else going on in the rooms excavated by Dietz. And it really is likely that these were some type of storerooms that weren't used for living purposes. But when we look at rooms three and four on the uppermost floor where the supposed European soldier would have lived, we're finding a lot of traditional Chumash activities. Here's a classic pestle that was on top of the floor. Here's an abalone shell that had asphaltum on the inside. So this is a traditional source of knowledge to find the asphalt, use it in the way, to put it in the abalone shell and heat it and use it in another way, like a skirt weight or for hafting a spear point onto um, you know, some type of like handle. And um, we're also finding lithic debitage on the uppermost floor of rooms three and four. So the person that lived here had this traditional knowledge. But there are also some interesting artifacts that we don't see in the other rooms on the uppermost floor. There's this iron ring that wasn't identified anywhere else. There's this iron spur, and there was also this iron buckle. So the person that lived there had access to horses, which probably provided them more autonomy, which we know Native alcaldes and governors had in the mission, as well as speaking to the different types of dress that they would have adorned on themselves to potentially to distinguish themselves from the community. And this is similar to what has been found at Mission San Antonio in the Adobe Barracks. So there, Robert Hoover identified a unique room with this tile that was only on the floor of one of the apartments. And on that tile, there was this footprint, which was really interesting, as well as other etched designs. So there is a unique designated room that was found in these adobe barracks, and that matches up with some ethno-historic evidence that alcaldes lived in separate rooms. They lived in unique rooms. Okay, so this is what is also very interesting about what's going on in rooms three and four. They had a significant concentration of ceramics and glass. Um, the ceramics, or we'll start with the glass. There were five whole glass bottles that were identified under the floor. And while they don't look whole, when Beats excavated this area and came across these glass vessels, he noted that they were pieced together as if they had been excavated, as if they had been buried whole. So when these are fully reconstructed, constructed, which Dietz did in his 1960 report, you can see that they are whole, but since the 60s to today, that didn't hold up. So, um, Nonetheless, by studying these bottles, we have a good idea of when they were used. This tall cylindrical spirit bottle with a moderately slender shoulder neck was used between 1820 and 1830. Everything else here is a little more abstract as far as the time it represents. And this is a tall square short neck spirit bottle that was used in the early 1800s. Here's a wine bottle that was used in the early 1800s, another one with patina, and then a tapered gin bottle. Um, this tall cylindrical spirit bottle really gives us a good reference to suggest when this caching event happened, which was between 1820 and 1830. And when we look at the whole ceramic vessels that were identified under room three as well, 
that were placed there whole, we could see that there is a picture here, which gives us an exact date of this cache. This picture, it represents um, a period of time. It was made exactly in 1825, and it is called something with Franklin's tomb um, when it was made by Epoch and Sons. So we know that this is a post-1825 cache, and everything else in this assemblage really tells us that this is like late 1820s, early 1830s. And this is significant before I get into that, because in the 1820s and 1830s, we already know that this is the Mexican War of Independence, and um, that things changed drastically at this time. The Chumash Revolt was in 1824. So we know that the mission landscape is radically changing. And um, El Calde specifically really lacked the means to reform the mission system or have a stake in its survival at this time. So while we can't really say for certain why a high status individual buried this cache under the floor, we can say that it really represents this period in time where there was a lot of social political upheaval that had to do with the waning Spanish frontier in the beginning of the Mexican period. So um, what did we find out from this all of the study that the marginalized space in the mission landscape has been revived through archeological praxis. There was a dynamic Chumash community that was socially stratified based upon access to resources and power and social wealth. Um, they navigated successive waves of Spanish and Mexican colonialism on their own terms and through community collaboration with living de descendants, this narrative of cultural persistence continues today. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That was amazing, Caitlin. Thank you. Yeah, everybody, let's give her a round of applause. So interesting. Um, I'm gonna uh, ask if anybody has some questions for her. Uh, let me um, stop sharing so I can see. Okay, here we go. Yeah, go ahead. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and speak up. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, are there any evidence of the 1824 revolt weapons or question mark? Is there a mass yeah. burial site? Um, as far as the revolt, we did find a musket ball in the floor of the adobe barracks. Now, whether that is directly related to the revolt, we can't say for certain but we know that the area from the house floor to the top of the roof tile collapse represents 1813 to about 1848. So right in the time of the Chumash revolt. And um, it may have been used um, as a part of that revolt. So that was the only thing that we found. Hmm. And, um, you know, the mass burial site, I really tried to stay clear of anything related to human remains over the course of the project and just really keep it into the domestic realm. Um, yes, there are burial sites that are on the property today because we know that the community lived there from 1813 to 1848 and um, that's all I can really speak to about that. The occupation was really late. So we know that the Chumash community um, stayed after the missions were secularized. Some of them joined new communities like um, Sackwell up at Los Alamos, where they created an entirely new indigenous community, really focused on bringing traditional ways back to life. And we know this through Harrington's notes with Fernando Labrado. Um, but we also know that people did stay behind the missions. 
until about 1848 before they could have joined the growing city of Ventura when the um, when the railroad came through as well as distributed well throughout. So just a lot of disruption after um, really Spanish, Mexican, and then the making of the American West. How late was the building standing? Uh, about 1848. So that all came down at that point. Yeah, it just wasn't being cared for anymore. Okay. I was gonna ask about the extent to which this site is comparable to that at uh, Santa Clara where Kuksu pendants were being produced under the watchful eyes of the friars there and what that might have to say about the political economies within each of these respective missions, given that I think a lot of the narrative has tended to be dominated by the idea that there, there was no free will, there was no agency, with the exception of the work of Panitch and you know, uh, Sim Schneider, you have that coming into the fray. Whereas a lot of the work I've done over the years, I didn't see that. And, you know, the, but it was clear from the archeology span that we're seeing those kinds of initiatives. And so in other words, is there a distinct indigenous political economy uh, that is uh, basically being sustained in these institutions, despite these other narratives that suggest otherwise? Yes, yes, definitely. And I'm exploring this in the shell bead detritus that we uncovered there that turns out to just be the largest production site found in South Central California on the mainland. Um, a lot more shell bead detritus has been found on the Channel Islands, but we found the largest one on the mainland and in the mission. So we know that this is a production zone that the Chumash were using and drawing on their existing knowledge and their understanding of shell beads and trade and exchange systems. And I find it really interesting to kind of look at this at, through the lens of status, because mm -hmm. long before you know, the Spanish came in, these shell beads were intimately linked mm -hmm. to Chumash elites and their tamals to cross the channel and then distribute and have all of this access to wealth. And what we're seeing is if these shell beads are being used by the Chumash in the adobe barracks, then they're really, you know, keeping with this same social system. Yeah. And, um, but I also wanna call out that I'm debating this right now by looking at this island population that came to Mission La Parisima in 1816. You know, typically the people who would have lived in the adobe barracks had long-term trust and residency in the mission, and they would be the people who lived there. But if we're having this island population come in in 1816 and we're finding all of the Shelby detritus directly associated with the adobe barracks, could the residents of the barracks be watching the islanders oh. to produce these beads for them? Um, that is a thought that I'm exploring right now. Um, if these adobe barracks were certainly used um, as the status individuals, and it really looks like it is. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as far as more excavations, you know, I'm not looking to do any more excavations right now. Um, I really want the full support of the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians, as well as other local community groups that aren't for San Inez, like the Barbarino and Venturano, the Northern Chumash, um, Allen, you know, the C in Simi Valley. Um, and my next goal is to really start from the ground up with having a strong indigenous collaboration before I place another unit at a site and really just working on publishing the data that we have so far with members of the community. And um, did you have access to the Padres journals? There is the Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library that has a lot of the Padres journals and they're very hard to interpret. <laughs> so I had to kind of pick and choose how I was gonna spend my time, but I would love to to see more of the Padres journals and kind of look at it through the framework of how they're identifying some things. 
Is there any records of harsh treatment? Yes, yes, there is. We know that, that there were floggings and whippings and that this has been recorded. In the interrogado, I think it's called, in like the 18, yes, um, Geiger and Mayhem. Yes, they recorded some of this in their um, question survey that were for the missions to kind of talk about the daily life that was going on at the missions. I, I was curious, um, to what extent did some of the conflict that existed in the pre-Hispanic era and the Chumas uh, channel uh, translate into the competition that might have adhered in the case of this production of shell beads? Because I, I know I've, I've heard a number of talks about that uh, inter, well, inter-community conflict, if you will. You have the Channel Islanders producing material, and then as soon as it was dispersed across the channel, or at least the coast, you had various groups competing for that. And I was wondering if there's any uh, suggestion of that within this mission context between, I, I realize uh, your, your project was specific to that one compound, but if there would be any evidence of that kind of conflict as well there. That's really interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, once these new pan-regional identities were formed, mm -hmm. there were new marital practices, practices there were um, distinct factional that formed and a lot of in you know, Pilo shows that there are at Mission San Antonio, I think, where they're drawing from their existing kind of chiefdom status and these existing kinships and they're bringing it into the mission um, and they're able to kind of maintain some of their statuses. So yeah, I think that going to those mission records and seeing what's going on um, as far as these pre-existing factions that are occurring and how that might have played out is really interesting. Well, the reason I, I, I asked that is because, you know, I've also done studies of uh, Chicano street gangs in, in areas like El Paso, and they had uh, tenement buildings where you had particular barrios or neighborhoods that pre-existed for some time. They were really dilapidated. And then the city decides uh, with their brilliance to come in and build a whole new housing complex. And they emptied all of the rival barrios into the same housing complex. And it turned into World War III between the gangs. And they clearly demarcated and delineated uh, these rival turfs. And uh, some of it was pretty violent. And I'm just curious uh, because I've, I've seen this in many of the missions where you have multiple uh, communities or bands or, or tribes, if you will, they're all brought into the same mission where there may have been pre-existing rivalries where that were not taken into account by the missionaries, either by virtue of the fact that the missionaries had not mastered the indigenous languages or did not understand the cultural milieu of those particular communities. And so it did create uh, inter-community conflict in these areas. And I'm, I'm just curious, because I know we had the 1824 revolt, which I've always insisted was a, a revolt against the Mexicans, you know, my ancestors. And uh, essentially, uh, this was because of the abuses of those soldiers. And, and yet, in some of the accounts, you have the Padres actually giving refuge to the rebels who were being now pursued by the Mexican military. So there's a, that's a very interesting site in terms of the political dynamics. Yeah, it is. It, just thinking about what happens when these communities come together to form one central community and what the change that happens, oh. um, I think is really interesting. So, well, thank you. Okay, any other questions for Caitlin? All right. Well, we'll let you have your evening oh, back. Oh, I think so, Alan sent Alan sent one more. Um, okay. Where did they go? We know that there were a few autonomous communities that started outside of Mission La Purisima that gave way eventually to Mission um, the Reservation and the San Yanez Band. Um, but really at this time, especially in the 1850s, once the railroad came in, it was just very widely dispersed where they ended up. We know that some of them ended up in this downtown Ventura. Um, 
Lompoc and in these booming towns that had just started. Um, yeah. But these are all good questions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, anything else? I'm going to stop recording now.